For the people of God, there is nothing ordinary done in obedience to Jesus Christ. It is all cosmic. It is magnificent. How does God's covenant love for us, his people, make every act of obedience to Christ magnificent? That's the question that John Piper answers from Ruth 4 in this episode of Light and Truth. This sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on July 22, 1984. The life of the godly is not a straight line to glory, but they do get there. The life of the godly is not an interstate highway in Nebraska. It is a state road through the Blue Ridge Mountains of Tennessee. There are rock slides and precipices and dark mists and bears and slippery curves and hairpin turns that make you go backwards in order to go forwards. And all along this hazardous, curvy way, there are signs. And the signs say, the best is yet to come. And written at the bottom of every sign in his unmistakable handwriting are the words, As I live, says the Lord. In all of your setbacks this summer, the message of this book is, God has been plotting for your joy and your glory, whether you've recognized it yet or not. This book is just a series of setbacks, isn't it? Just one setback after the other, almost right up to the very end. Let's review for a minute. Chapter 1, Naomi and her husband and her two sons are driven by the famine out of Judah. They go to Moab and her husband dies. Her sons marry Moabite women. They're childless for 10 years, and then the sons die and leave her with two daughters-in-law destitute. Setback series number one. The chapter closes with a bitter complaint. I went away full, Naomi said, and the Lord has brought me back empty. The Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Chapter two. Now, in chapter two, hope dawns. Naomi becomes filled with hope because Boaz comes onto the scene. Boaz is a man who could marry Ruth, raise up offspring to Elimelech and to uh, Malon, and it would be great. But Boaz doesn't propose. He doesn't seem to make any moves. He doesn't seem to make any moves. And the chapter closes with everybody brimming with hope, but nobody knowing quite how this is all going to work out. Suspense, uncertainty, chapter 3. Naomi and Ruth make a very risky move in the middle of the night. Ruth goes down there and crawls under the covers at at, uh, Boaz's feet and says, in effect, I would like you to throw your wing over me and become my husband. And she has read him correctly, and he agrees, in effect. And it looks as though this uh, setback of Ruth and Naomi's widowhood is going to resolve into a beautiful love story. And a big boulder rolls down onto the Blue Ridge State Road. Namely, there's a nearer kinsman who has a right to Ruth before Boaz. That's chapter 4. Well, after that midnight rendezvous there on the threshing floor, Boaz goes to the city gate early in the morning and along comes the nearer kinsman who has the right to Ruth. And so Boaz lays out the case before him. A man of great integrity will not try to finagle. He says, here's the situation. What are you going to do? And in verse four, the man says to our utter dismay, I will redeem it. We don't want him to redeem it. We want Boaz to redeem it. But he says he's going to redeem it, and that's a setback. It doesn't last very long in the text. But if we were to stop reading there, we'd be very disappointed. 
The surprising thing about this setback or the helpful thing to notice is that it's a setback owing to righteousness. This fellow's doing his duty. He's not sinning. He's doing what he ought to do. And we need to learn, don't we, that a lot of setbacks in life that make our lives miserable are owing to righteousness. You're driving down the uh, state road through Tennessee. A boulder might stop you, but also these little guys dressed in orange with their little flags might stop you. And they're not doing anything wrong. They're just working, doing their duty, wrecking your day. And we need to realize that a lot of the murmuring and grumbling in our lives is owing to what we think is ill-timed righteousness. Do your duty another day. Thank you. Just when we're about to say, oh, no, stop the story. Don't let this fellow have Ruth. Boaz says, you know, don't you, my friend, that Naomi has a daughter in law and that part of the custom is that when you redeem the land, you also redeem the name by taking the daughter and raising up seed. And the man says, I can't do it. And we say, Ray, good. Whatever the reason, perhaps the man was already married. That would be the most generous contribution to his character. That's probably what it was. He was already married, so he couldn't do it. So here goes uh, Boaz highballing it down the Blue Ridge with this beautiful woman under his arm on the way to marriage. But in true form, a big cloud lingering over this road ahead, namely Ruth is barren. At least I think the author of this book wants us to entertain that serious possibility because back in chapter 1, verse 4, it says very plainly, they had been married, she and Malon, for 10 years, no children. That's not normal in that culture. People don't decide to be childless in Jewish culture. Something was wrong. So the big question arises, how are they going to get over this setback? And that cloud over the head of Ruth and Boaz is big with mercy, and it breaks, in verse 13, on their heads. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception. And she bore a son. And then something interesting happens in the story, and it's crucial to understanding what the whole book is about. The rest of the story, Ruth vanishes. She's gone. Ruth is not the main character in this book. It ought to be called Naomi. Naomi is the main character in this book. The lesson of this book rides on Naomi. She becomes the person center stage with this child of hope. At the end of the book. Now, why? Why is that? We had a grubby guy come into the church office here about three years ago, and uh, he was asking for help. And I came out from my office and said, what's your name? And he said, hard times. I said, I mean, I'm serious. What's your name? He said, hard times. He pulled his wallet out, showed me his name tag. Hard times. Had a last name. I forgot it. The author of this book wants us to call Naomi hard times Naomi in chapter one. He wants us to feel that this woman is just hard times. The book begins with death, her husband, her sons, and the book ends with birth. Whose birth? A son. Whose son? Look at verse 17. This is the destination of Naomi's long, twisted Blue Ridge State Road. And the woman, the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. Now, isn't that strange? Why did they say that? Why does the author pick up on that and focus on that? You know why? Because he wanted to show that chapter 2, verse 21, was not true. That when Naomi came back with a deceased husband and two deceased sons and said, the Lord has brought me back empty 
from Moab. It wasn't true. And if we listen to this book, if we learn the lesson of the book of Ruth and trust God and are patient, then all of our complaints against God will be shown false in the end. Ruth was written to help us see these signposts of grace along the way in our very curvy and twisted life. Even when the clouds are so thick, we can't tell what's coming. It wants to be a signpost to say the best is yet to come. Let's go back for a moment and remind ourselves of this crucial fact about this book. It was God who at every setback in this book was the one who turned the setback into a stepping stone of joy and hope. I want to show you that just by way of survey to sum up the book. First, Naomi's whole life fell in. It collapsed, caved in in Moab. Her husband dies. She's out of her own country. Her two sons die. She's destitute with these two foreign daughters-in-law. And it is God who gives her Ruth in great commitment and allegiance. And the reason I know it's God at work and not just some quirk of fate is because of two texts. Chapter one, verse 16, where Ruth says to her, your God will be my God. In other words, at the very root and bottom of Ruth's commitment to Naomi is Ruth's commitment to Naomi's God. If Ruth looks about and says, to whom am I to give thanks for this woman? The text leaves no doubt. It's to God that she should give thanks. And the other text is chapter 2, verse 12, where it says that when Naomi or when Ruth came to Judah, she was coming to take refuge under the wings of God. Remember that one? If she's coming to take refuge under the wings of God, then it's God in all of his attractiveness that has drawn Ruth to have the courage and the freedom to leave mother and father and land and language and go with her mother-in-law. So if Naomi can see it's God at work to give her Ruth, she could only see what was coming. Second, Naomi gives the impression in chapter one that there's no hope. There's nobody back in Judah for Ruth or me to marry, to raise up offspring. It's all over. We're going to be childless the rest of our lives. There's no hope. Go home with mom and dad, Ruth. And God is at work in that very moment. In that very moment. To raise up a Boaz that she didn't know anything about. And the reason I know that God raised Boaz up is because Naomi herself says he did in chapter two, verse 20, where she's rejoicing in this accidental meeting, so-called, between Boaz and Ruth on the grain field. And she says that it was the kindness of God who has not forsaken the living or the dead. Let me stick in here a very insignificant way that God teaches us This principle that he is at work for our good while we are complaining against what's happening. Yesterday at home, uh, we just finished having our basement turned into an apartment so that we could have nice people live down there. And we had them add these steps at the back because of code requirements. And at the bottom, you've got to have a drain because all the water is going to go down there. So they put two feet of gravel under there. Then they cemented it over, and there's a little grate. And so we wash the steps, and it fills up with water. And uh, everybody's grumbling. I'm grumbling. Those no good 2,000 bucks of concrete work, and you can't even. So I go down there and pull the drain up and get a sledgehammer and hammer a thing down there, and it just goes right down. Very simple. Now. About a half an hour later, I thought to myself as I was theologizing about this crappy experience of mine. I said, uh, what if God hadn't let us wash that today and we'd gone on vacation tomorrow for five weeks and you'd had a five inch or ten inch rainfall? You see how good God was to me yesterday? I was 
belly aching the whole time. And he was working for me. It's every setback is like that. Every one for the Christian. He is at work for you in it while we complain. And so the lesson of this book is uh, count to ten before you complain. Number three, set back. She's barren. And I've already pointed out who overcomes this setback. And chapter four, verse 11 is beautiful. It's a little preparation for verse 13, because the townspeople say, may she be like Rachel. Leah. Well, now Rachel was barren. God made Rachel barren because he got upset with the way she was behaving. But then he relieved it and he gave her children and Leah. And so the townspeople probably knew this woman was married for 10 years without any children. Now she's getting married to this man. Her mother-in-law wants a son. We better pray that she be like Rachel. And she was like Rachel because verse 13 says God gave her conception. The lesson of this book is that at every setback, God is at work in your life to make it a stepping stone to glory and to joy. When she lost her husband and sons, God gave her Ruth. When she could think of no kinsman, God was giving her Boaz. When Ruth was barren, it was God who gave her conception. So the point of the story is the life of the godly is not a straight line to glory. But they get there because God sees to it. Now, if all we had in the book of Ruth was a quaint story about how a destitute grandmother finally gets a grandson from a daughter-in-law, I wouldn't use the word glory. If that's where the story ended, and it was just sort of a sentimental, encouraging little thing, I wouldn't, but that's not where the story ends. This writer lifts his eyes to the forests and the mountain snows of redemptive history. In verse 17, he very simply and auspiciously says, the child's name was Obed. He was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David. And all of a sudden we realize There has been something vast and expansive at stake here. Something far more has been going on in Moab and Bethlehem and in the lives of these seemingly insignificant people than just the contentment of a grandmother. These people are being put in touch with the vast scope of redemptive history. The name of David. For us Christians and for those Jews reading this book, we know what that name calls up. David, son of David, Messiah, greatest king that was ever in Israel. And his son someday is going to be king. New age, peace, righteousness, freedom from pain and crying and grief and guilt. This simple little story of Ruth opens out like a stream into a great river of hope that includes the whole world. And so is not the message, don't ever think that what you do in obedience to God in the midst of your setbacks is insignificant. Isn't it true that one of the The great diseases of our day is triviality. The things which most people spend most of their time with are trivial. And what makes this a disease is that we were created to be consumed with magnificent causes, not trifles. Our souls will not be content with trifles. Why? I ask you. Why is there a whole section of the Tribune devoted to sport? And nothing devoted to the most important events in history. The growth and expansion of the church of the King of Kings. It's madness, that's why. It is sheer madness that as a culture, we are consumed with games. 
There is no other explanation that we should make the proportion a hundred to one games with no eternal significance over the church of the almighty. It is madness in our culture. And we are enslaved to trivialities. We live in the Swiss village workshop and walk around and look and ooh and ah at these little figurines and never lift our eyes to the forests or to the everlasting snows beyond. So our souls shrivel up and our lives are trivial and our capacity for great worship is dead. Now, the book of Ruth is written to teach us that God's purpose for your life is bigger than that. God's purpose is to connect his people with something infinite, something great, something magnificent. For the Christian, there's always a connection between the ordinary gleaning in a field, having a baby, coming back from a foreign land, just ordinary things, never. For the people of God, there is nothing ordinary done in obedience to Jesus Christ. It is all cosmic. It is magnificent. God is preparing a demonstration to the principalities in the heavenly places of his own wisdom, and he's doing it in your daily lives if you had eyes to see. So the word glory isn't too big, my friends. It is not too big. It's too little. It's weak. It's lame. I wish I had words bigger and better than the word glory to describe what our destiny is and what the meaning of your Monday is tomorrow when it's connected to the king of kings and the destiny that he has for the world. David points to Jesus and Jesus points to the resurrection of our mortal bodies when there will be no more crying or pain or guilt anymore because the former things have passed away. The best is yet to come. I say it to the young among you who know it. Marriage, a career, health. And I say it to the old among you who know that every day this old tent is getting weaker and weaker. It is true for both. And I saw it in a parable on Friday. I saw this woman in a wheelchair. She was very old and she was very twisted and she couldn't control her movements. They were all over the place and her mouth hung open and she made funny sounds. And there was a man pushing her who was dressed nicely like all of you are. About 65 or 70, I would guess. And I just sat looking at them and trying to smile at her and her eyes are just flashing all over the place and meaninglessness. And as they got out of the elevator, I was wondering who this man was. He swung her around and said, watch your feet, sweetie pie. I don't know if that does to you what it did to me. As I was walking out to the car, I said to myself, if a marriage covenant can do that, can produce that kind of fidelity, that kind of commitment, that kind of affection under those circumstances, then it's easy to see, isn't it, and to believe that the great and magnificent terms of the new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ Free God in all righteousness to say to Odette and Harold and Mary Agnes and you and me, no matter how sick, how beautiful, how ugly, sweetie pie. And if God can call us that, then I have all authority from the word that the best is yet to come, no matter what. This is Light and Truth. God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper will preach a sermon on true worship in our new series titled, What is True Worship? I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.